So, um, hi everyone. Today's session is the final session on legal methods um, and it is the assignment discussion session. So before I go into the assignment discussion session, um, I'm going to give you a summary um, of each of the learning outcomes that we've done uh, in order for you to have it refreshed in your mind, but also each of the individual um, learning outcomes have been recorded individually. So this is quite, a, it'll be quite a quick summary of what we've gone through in each learning outcome. So I'll just share the screen with you. Um, so the And then we'll discuss the assignment, okay? So, so the first learning outcome is, um, for the legal methods module is uh, to understand the sources of law. And we went on to look at um, understanding the, and identifying uh, the legal sources and materials. Um, and we looked at the principles of English legal systems. So we looked at how to cite cases. So we looked at what each element of the case means when you fully cite it in a in an assignment or anything so what Davies means which is the name of the claimant Johnson depend uh, is the defendant the day it was reported the volume number and the weekly law reports and the page the case is on so we'll and then you've got criminal cases and what they mean as well what these um the actual um acronyms actually mean uh, in criminal cases as well. We went through that. We then went through the importance of law reports and how many, how there are so many different law reports for you to go through in regards to, you know, trying to identify a case or get any sort of information on a case as well. Uh, statutes, again, we looked at the importance of statutes, the importance of section numbers, the importance of subsections and paragraphs within subsections. We then went to look at um, the key judicial offices in the English legal system. And we looked at um, the Supreme Court, um, the head of judiciary and the president of the courts of England and Wales. We went on to look at the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 and the importance of the Constitutional Reform Act in regards to the Lord Chancellor's role and how that changed. Um, we then went on to look at some self-assessment questions and some key, key terminology in regard to sources of law, what sources of law are. So we looked at primary sources and secondary sources. Um, and then we went on to look at uh, how uh, the UK is divided into three jurisdictions, England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and each jurisdiction, how it has its own laws within it. We then went on to look at common law and statute and the importance of this within UK Parliament um, and the issue around, we also looked at civil law um, and the what civil law is um, and how it's different from criminal law. Some types of civil law, we looked at contract law, uh, tort law, uh, and we looked at... Um, company law as well, which is part of civil law, which is a form of compensation that someone gets rather than criminal law, it's an uh, element of uh, punishment. So we looked at revenue law as well, which uh, looks at inheritance taxes, VAT, intellectual property, so patents, copyright, media and communications law, family law and the court of protection. So things like divorce, matrimonial um, and like things like you know disputes in regards to care proceedings we then went on to distinguish uh 1.1 which was to distinguish between uh primary secondary and delegated legislation um we then went on to the types of legislation so we've got public bills private bills uh subordinate legislation and um, we looked at what primary legislation was and secondary legislation. Um, we then looked at 1.2, um, the hierarchy within staff resources and case law. 
and we looked at what statutory source is, the four types of statutory sources, which is uh, legislation, common law, European law, and the European Convention on Human Rights, um, and the hierarchy of laws as well, regulations, procedures, codes of conduct. Uh, we briefly looked at the hierarchy of the courts, which was UK, Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, High Court, Crown Court, Magistrates, County Court, Family Court, and then the Tribunal. So you have Employment Tribunal, um, the Upper Tribunal and the First Tier Tribunal. We then looked at the stages in English law. So before a bill uh, becomes a law, we looked at the stages in the House of Lords and House of Commons. So you have the introduction, first stage, second stage, committee stage, report stage, and third reading, and then the Royal Assent, which is up to the Queen to sign, the King, sorry, to sign off uh, the bill to make sure that it becomes law. We looked at 1.3, which was to explain the impact of Human Rights Act, so what Human Rights Act means and why it's so important in regards to the UK. We looked at the European Convention on Human Rights and when that came into force in 1951 and the importance of the European Convention on Human Rights. We then went looking at the Human Rights Act again. Uh, how does the Human Rights Act affect individuals? Um, an example of this, and we looked at Article 4, which is the prohibition of slavery and forced labour. So everyone has the right not to be treated like a slave um, or servitude to perform any sort of compulsory or forced labour. So that's working without, you know, your will, you know, being able to work and not be punished for the work or not be given any money for the work. We then looked at 1D1, which is the analysed tension between secondary legislation and the principles of separation of powers. And we looked at the importance of the separation of powers, how this three institutions within this triangle. So you have the legislature, the executive and the judiciary and looked at their powers within separation of powers. We looked at the separation of powers in the UK. We also looked at how they work together. So how the executive and legislature work together, how the legislature and judiciary work together and also the executive and the judiciary. We then concluded with regards to separation of powers and why there was a need to have separation of powers. And then we provided a reference list. So are you okay with learning outcome one, uh, Ada? Yes, thank yes. you. Thanks okay, so much. we'll move on to learning outcome two now. Okay, so, so and I'm quickly summarizing so that we could go on to the assignment so you have a better idea, okay? Um, share this so the next one we looked at was learning outcome two and this looked at the principles of legal interpretation learning outcome two so we looked at the different types of law so uh, natural law positive law national law international law we then went on to common law which was public private administrative statute case law we then, again, reiterated the importance of the hierarchy of courts, why it's so important, and um, what happens within the courts and who sits within the courts to hear the decisions. Um, we looked at the Court of Appeal, Upper Tribunal and First Tribunal. Uh, we looked at the principle of stare decisis and why it's so important within um, the doctrine of precedent, uh, where courts need to look at the principle in regards to stare decisis and also the difference between precedent and stare decisis. We then went on to the uh, what ratio decidendi was and orbiter dicta and per curium and the relevance of that. We looked at 2.1, which was to explain the doctrine of judicial precedent and why it's so important within um, the courts and why they apply the principles of um, judicial precedent. Again, uh, referring back to the hierarchy of the courts. We looked at the European Court of Justice, uh, when it was set up and why it was set up. Uh, we looked at the Court of Appeal within the civil division um, and how it's bound by the House of Lords. We then went on to look at the Court of Appeal in the criminal division um, and referred to cases such as R and Taylor. Uh, we then went on to look at the High Court and how it's bound by the Court of Appeal and the House of Lords. Um, and 
we looked at the Great Manchester Coroner's case. We looked at the Crown Courts and the County Courts and Magistrates Courts. We then went on to 2.2, .2, which was to distinguish between binding, non-binding and persuasive decisions and how binding um, the difference between sense. So they bind judges that make future decisions. So binding precedent is must be followed and persuasive precedent may be influential with the judge, but may be disregarded. We then looked at the importance of binding precedent and the importance of a higher court being able to overrule a decision in an earlier or lower court. Uh, we went to look, we then went on to look at per incurium um, and looked at the moral case. Uh, we looked at persuasive precedents and the importance within the UK, why it's so important. We then went on to look at advantages and disadvantages for uh, of precedent. Then we went on to 2.3, which was to illustrate, illustrate the operation of literal rule, golden rule and persuasive, purposive rules of statutory interpretation. So what each rule went. So we, we went through the literal rule and why it was so important. So whatever the literal rule is, whenever a law is passed, that is what the words say and that is what the judges will follow. But it doesn't always work in literal rule. So we had the golden rule and this was implemented um, where the courts feel like there's some sort of absurdity so they can look at another meaning of the word. So, you know, it gives them, the courts the flexibility to, uh, you know, because there's no clear meaning of the word. Then we looked at the mischief rule um, with regard to Hayden's case, 1584, and the important principles that were adopted in that case. We then went off on to look at the purposive approach uh, and the Margot and St. Mellon's rule of district council uh, and what the decision was and the, uh, the Lord Denning stated in that case. We then looked at the presumptions in regard to uh, where courts will make certain presumptions about the law and the main presumptions, and we looked at the four main presumptions. We then went on to 2M1, which was determine the ratio of decedendi and obita dicta from a given legal case. And we looked at uh, St uh, Donahue and Stevenson. Again, R and Raw, and these are all available on uh, Westlaw for you, but also on uh, Moodle. Uh, we also looked at how to find a ratio decedendi case or an obiter dicta case, and where you would research that. And there were some references there, links that you could go on to in regards to learning outcome two. Okay, so have you got any questions on learning outcome two, uh, Ada? No, thank you. Oh, is Jack, Jacqueline, are you on as well? Yeah. Oh, hi, Jacqueline, you okay? Nice to meet you as well. So I'm just, what I'm doing is we've got um the assignment session today, but I'm going through a summary of what we've done in each session before we start with the assignment session, okay? Is that okay for both of you, yeah? Ada? Yes. 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 So, thank you. So we've gone through quickly on learning outcome two. So now I'm going to go through learning outcome three. Just one minute. I'll just share it with you. So now we're going to just go through learning outcome three quite quickly because all these are recorded individually. So if you need to get onto them, they're all recorded for you individually as well. Learning outcome three, we looked at understanding the structure of legal profession, the judiciary and the magistrates. We looked again at recapping on the court system, the importance of uh, criminal cases, the differences between criminal courts and civil courts. Um, and we looked at uh, the Court of Appeal, Crown Court, Magistrates Court for criminal cases and for Civil Court of Appeal, High Court of Justice and County Courts. We looked at 3.1 and we looked at the structure of criminal and civil courts. So again, we're looking at the structure here. 
uh, with reference to who sits in the court. So the UK Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, High Court, Crown Court, Magistrates Court, County Court, Family Court, the Employment Tribunal, Employment Tribunal in England, Wales and Scotland, Upper Tribunal and First Tier Tribunal. And we looked at the criminal justice. Uh, so who deals with that? Things like we looked at the Crown Prosecution Service. We looked at the Court of Appeal, the Criminal Division. We then went on to the High Court Judge, which was the Criminal Jurisdiction. We then looked at the Circuit Judges, that's it, so solely deal with uh, the criminal work. Um, we then went on to the Civil Court Structure, so the Magistrates Court, County Court, High Court, Court of Appeal and Supreme Court of the UK. And we looked at each court, so the Magistrates Court, what they hear, who works in the Magistrates Court, who's bound by it and who binds it and the appeals. We did the same for the County Court, uh, what they hear, uh, all civil cases, who deals with it, the district judges. They are bound by High Court, the Court of Appeals, Supreme Court and European Court of Justice. We then went on to the Crown Court, what they hear, what kind of cases and then the people that work there, who is bound by it. Then we went on to the High Court again, what kind of cases they hear, uh, the personnel that work there and the, who's bound by that. We also went on to look at the Queen's Bench Division and what kind of cases they hear, things like contract law, personal injury, negligence. Um, we then went on to the Chancery Division, which looks at business law, trust, probate and land law. Um, and the family division that deals with, as it says, guardianship, uh, matrimonials, um, cases such as, you know, uh, maybe like getting uh, parental responsibility, anything in relation to children. We then went on to the civil division of the Court of Appeal and uh, again, looking at who hears this, the personnel who work there, who it's bound by and the binds and appeals. Supreme Court. Uh, one of the um, the final court of appeal in civil cases, um, and it's staffed by 12 judges. Uh, it's bound by its own decisions because it's one of the highest courts. We then went on to look at 3.2, which was to analyse the role of judiciary and the judicial appointment system within the Constitutional Reform Act 2005. Uh, we looked at the changes within the Constitutional Reform Act 2005. Uh, we looked at the process of appointments so or intellectual capacity, uh, personal qualities, ability to understand and deal fairly, authoritative and communication skill and efficiency. We then went on to 3.3, .3, which was to analyze the function of the jury in criminal cases and what their function is and what their role is within criminal cases. We also looked at the issue of uh, how Juries can try a case in the Crown Court if the defendant pleads not guilty. Um, and how 95% of cases are heard within Magistrates Court before going to the Crown Court. And the reason they go to Crown Court is if uh, the Magistrates Court judges do not have the jurisdiction to deal with the cases. Um, then we went on to 3M1, which was to analyse parliamentary and governmental efforts to widen access to profession, a legal profession. And we looked at the Constitutional Reform Act 2005. Um, and then there were loads of, there was articles on Moodle that you could look at in regard to that. We looked at the Hazel Green Report, which again is on Moodle and looks at the Legal Services Act 2007. Uh, and we looked at the um, report on Moodle on LETER report in regards to the review on Moodle. Um, in regards to the courts. Also looked at compare and contrast the benefits and drawbacks of different types of alternative dispute res resolution, which was AC3M2. And we looked at the advantages and the disadvantages of uh, alternative dispute resolution with an article there. So that's things like mediation, um, you know, um, the alternative negotiation and things like that. Uh, again, a little bit of a quiz that we could look at in regards to Constitutional Reform Act, Legal Services Commission and the Legal Education and Training Review and some references there that you could use for this session. Uh, we then went on to look at the European Court of Human Rights, when it was set up, 
why it was set up and why the importance, what was the importance of the European Court of Justice. Uh, and that was that mainly dealt with uh, European matters um, in the in within the EU. We then went on to look at the Privy Council and Judicial Committee of the Privy Council as the final Court of Appeal, um, and tribunals as well. The importance of having first tier tribunals and upper tier tribunals on things like you know immigration, asylum, uh, tax and chancery, lands uh, chambers, um, and why there was a need to have individual tribunals in regards to that. Again, we went on to looking at employment tribunals. And these are things like, you know, if someone is at work and they've been dismissed unfairly, any forms of discrimination, they would go to an employment tribunal. So we we looked at uh, Learning Outcome 3 with reference to uh, links to Moodle, uh, any sort of journal articles, any additional reading that you could do, you could go on to Moodle. Is there any questions on Learning Outcome 3? No, thank you. No? Okay, so the next one we need to go on to is just... Jacqueline, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Excellent, thank you. So now we're just going to be looking at learning outcome four. Remember, there are four sessions done on this. That's why I'm going through this quite quick because we've got the assignment discussion to do more. So um, learning outcome four, to understand the criminal and civil justice system and the alternative methods of dispute resolution. So 4.1, we needed to assess the duty and powers of the police. So powers of arrest. So you've got PACE, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, which deals with powers of arrest um, and the PACE codes as well. So what, what the procedure would be if you wanted to arrest someone for the police. Police powers to stop and search. So your rights as an individual as well, you know, what what the police should ask you when they stop you. Um, and they should always tell you why they stop you. Uh, stop and search uh, police powers, uh, they can stop you for reasonable grounds to suspect you have illegal drugs, a weapon or stolen property. We then went on to the right to representation, how you can get free legal representation once you are arrested. Um, we then went on to looking at 4.2, which was assessing the role of the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, where they the, their role, main role is to prosecute criminal cases that have been investigated by the police and other investigative organisations in Ingle, England and Wales. And they are an independent um, organisation and they are independent of the police and uh, government. Uh, the CPS, what their role is, what their functions are and what their duties are. And they are, you know, they must prosecutors must be fair, objective and independent. Um, and the we looked at the director um, of public prosecutions within the CPS, Crown Prosecution Service. They've got the senior Crown Council, uh, Crown Council, Crown Council 2, Crown Council 2, executive officer, senior clerk, junior clerk, two of them, and petty officer. We looked at the code of uh, conduct that uh, the caseworkers must uh, follow when uh, dealing with the case in the Crown Prosecution Service. We looked at the Crown Prosecution's five main roles and how it works uh, in regards to advising, reviewing, deciding, preparing and presenting a case. We then went on to 4.3 and looked at the latest reforms to the civil justice process, so how there was a need to reform it and how there are several problems within the criminal justice system, things like high costing, excessive delays and complexities of trials. We then went on to look at each element. So firstly, how expensive it is, how slow it is and how there's so many delays within it. And then we went on to look at the new landscape of civil litigation, which is the civil procedure rules, which came into force and why they came into force. We then went on to 4M1. Uh, to compare and contrast the benefits and drawbacks of the different types of alternative dispute resolution. We looked at the Wolf's report in regards to access to justice report on alternative dispute resolution. Um, and we looked at um, the issue around, you know, the different forms of alternative dispute resolution. 
uh, and how it's cheaper and quicker than ordinary civil courts. So we looked at uh, one form is mediation, another form is arbitration, uh, conciliation and negotiation and why it's so important rather than going to court to mediate. We then went on to 4D1, which was to analyse social, political and economic causes of miscarriages of justice. And, you know, this is, miscarriages of justice is where the judicial system is grossly unfair. And that, that has happened quite a lot within certain cases where people have uh, pleaded uh, not guilty and uh, the sentence is um, unfair and they've been given a custodial sentence. So there's causes of miscarriages of justice and there's various cases. Uh, what are the seven most common causes of wrongful conviction? Uh, we looked at them and how they contribute to cases. We then look, uh, they were, then we referred to references that you could go on to help you around learning outcome for uh, that need to be referred to and you can link on them to get extra sources. So any questions around learning outcome for? Uh, no, no questions, anyone? No. Uh, Jacqueline, have you got any questions around learning outcome for? Okay. So no, then we went on to the. Sorry, what was that, Jacqueline? No, thank you. Okay. So then we went on to the file and learning outcome before the uh, assignment discussion. And this is learning outcome five. And this is looking at. Uh, how to use legal writing and mooting skills. And what is mooting? Why is it so important? We looked at, you know, the, the reason it's an oral presentation. Uh, it, it's a fictitious legal debate between two parties and, you know, the argument on points of law. Uh, so stu two students, a counsel on each side argue points of law of, arising from like a fictitious um, appeal. Um, and we looked at how the judges are involved. We looked at the importance of court bundles, you know, why it's so important before you go into court to have, you know, a bundle ready and the importance of uh, activities, why mooting is so important. We looked at preparing your moot, how you need to look at before, you know, you participate, you you need to do your research, you need to be able to present your work, uh, present your moot. So you need to be quite professional. You need uh, to be talking in a manner which is professional because you'll be uh, referring to the judges as lady or my lordship. So you need to look at the language used as well. It's really, really important, uh, you know, and you need to be organised. You need to be organised. You need to be preparing your notes. When you do a bundle, you need to make sure that your bundle is numbered and highlighted. Structure of a moot, so how you it is structured. So you need to, you know, have a structure, you know, before you go into it. It can't be a role play. You need to make sure you're organised. You need to make sure you, uh, you've you got all the research in place. You need to make sure that you're preparing notes and your principal submissions. You need to make sure if you're addressing the judge properly as well. Uh, and you need to make sure that, you know, you're ha able to handle questions because, you know, you, you'll you'll be given and thrown questions at by the judges. Researching your moot. So why is researching so important? So, you know, you need to be able to research your work so that, you know, you're able to um, think about, you know, if, if you're researching your work and you're researching your mooting, you're able to refer to cases, previous cases. So if there's an argument you could refer back to that case, you know, so you need to be able to uh, have your legal thinking and research on the basis and on points so that you're able to identify that. And also you need to be able to work in a team properly because, you know, you are the one that are advocating the moot across. So it's a, it's a bit of fun, but it's an excellent way of learning and an excellent way of practicing and uh, perfectly, uh, you know, your advocacy skills would increase, you know, and you would become a better person because, you know, you'd be able to be more confident. You'd be able to, you know, deal with cases. So you need to make sure that, you know, you are, um, you have all the research in place. So if any, if there's any legal issues that need to be researched, you have them, you have your notes in place, you are organized because once uh, the judge asks you questions, uh, you are able to, you know, prepare and answer them questions. And, you know, don't, don't, 
make you know when you do a moot don't make you know don't do it as a role play you know have your submissions in place have your questions in pa place have your ideas in place as well and speak clearly you know speak slowly take notes make sure you have eye contact as well they're really important in mooting again some tips uh for um you make sure you speak up every judge's prima facie uh speak slowly uh and you know give if the judge is taking notes give them time to keep up adopt a pleasant courteous manner because it's so important that you are professional but courteous maintain again eye contact it's not be it's best not to try to be funny and you know don't play with your hands keep your hands out of your pockets do not slouch do not walk around do not play with your hair you know people tend to fiddle when they're nervous you know avoid doing that you know and when you're referring addressing the judge or the counsel you know you would say um if it's the judge you would say my lord or my lady you wouldn't refer to them as uh sir nor your lordship for example my lord my next submission is referring to the judge um you know it's really important that you also introduce yourself you know your name what you are here for uh, and you would refer to your counsel, the opposing counsel, as my learned friend, rather than, oh, the counsel. Um, outline the facts of the case. Make sure you understand your submissions. Make sure you are able to handle questions and suggestions and prepare for your questions. And also, the most important thing is think before you speak. Uh, responding to questions, uh, citing cases, these are really important tips. Importance of a bundle, we looked at what it must include, why it's so important. Make sure it has page numbers on so you are referring uh, the judge to them or the council and make sure they're highlighted points. We also looked at 5.2, which was to analyse and apply relevant cases. Uh, and we were giving you a scenario of Harry Pollard. Um, and in this scenario, you had to look at uh, these elements and prepare, uh, you know, try to prepare uh, uh, information around that. So loss of earnings, um, what Harry had suffered, PTSD. We then looked at 5.3, which was to present the argument for the parties involved in a given mooting scenario. So in this this is, we looked at the law in regards to Harry's situation where there was a fire and where he saw people getting burnt in the fire. And this it was a mooting scenario that you needed to deal with. Uh, some of the laws around the mooting scenario and then uh, some of the case law around it and what the ratio decidendi was. We looked at 5D1, evaluate the claim in Harry's situation and the defence based on the given uh, scenario. So some cases like McFallon, Alcock and White, and then some references that you could use and some videos there on mooting that you could go on to help you. Any questions on learning outcome five? No, so thank now, you. So now I'm gonna to go to the assignment session, which is... Um, if I can screen share So now we've gone through all the learning outcomes in brief detail, uh, and there are videos for each one. We're going to look at the assignment method, okay? So the assignment is, um, it's just, there but we'll go through each I think we'll go through this first okay so the assignment session the scenario you are employed in a law firm and have been asked to prepare notes on the law and legal system in the UK for a talk that one of the partners has been asked to give to prospective law students you should include relevant legislation and cases to illustrate your points where appropriate you need to produce a file of notes for the lectures. In this file, you must uh, distinguish between primary, secondary, and delegated legislation. Now, when you are doing your assignment, you must make sure you know your you have this as a heading. Can you see this? This must yeah. be your heading. Before you distinguish and talk about the assignment, you must have this as a heading. You must be using Harvard referencing. You must have your module. 
uh, details on the assignment cover. So you must have your name, your details of the module, and you must have each one under a heading so that the learn that the person marking it will understand the assessor. Okay, so you must have that. So in this one, first one, you must distinguish between primary and secondary and delegated legislation. And that's AC 1.1. You need to demonstrate their knowledge of how the law and court systems operate. You need to show an understanding of the different sources of legislation and how legislation and case law are applied in the court. You need to look at the issue of separation of powers and how secondary legislation may be a departure from this principle. You need to refer to learning outcome one from slides to 22 to 25 and approximately have 200 words. Here, a table would be ideal. Then the next element, you need to look at explaining so you would have this as a heading. Do you understand, yeah? Do you both understand that? Make sure you're clear with your headings, yeah? So explain the hierarchy yes. with statutory sources and the case law, and that's AC 1.2. You, you should explain the different courts and their structure, drawing the distinction between civil and criminal courts, hierarchies and the legal roles of personnel within civil and criminal courts. Use this slide to explain the different courts and the structure. So you need it for civil and you need it for criminal as well, and explain what the roles of the people working within it and what they do within that court. Then the third element, you would look at this part, which is explain the impact of the Human Rights Act, and that's AC 1.3. You refer to the handout 1.3 Human Rights Act and summarise in 50 to 70 words, covering the various articles and its relevance. Here you need to cover what is human rights, which is 20 words, very briefly. What is the Human Rights Act, 20 to 30 words, and mention the different articles from Article 2 up to Article 4 of the Human Rights Act. The next part is to illustrate the operation of literal, golden and purposive rules of uh, statutory interpretation, and that's AC 2.3. Here you should show an understanding of the different sources of legislation and how legislation and case law are applied in the court. Here you need to talk about the three rules, uh, the literal, golden, mischief and purposive approach and refer to article 20 to 26. As it is asking for illustration, you need to have an example of purposive approach and complete this task. And that is 70 to 100 words. Are you okay there, anyone? Any questions? No? Uh, the next one is analyze the structure of the criminal and civil courts, AC 3.1. Here you should explain the different courts and their structure, drawing the distinction between civil and criminal court hierarchies and the legal roles. Here you have the diagram to discuss the structure of the courts and you can see this for your own country. Because of the analysis, you will need to explain the structure and criminal court and how they deal with cases. And that's uh, referred to slides four to 19 and maximum words 100 to 125. The next one is to analyze the role of the judiciary and the judicial appointment process, AC 3.2. In this, you should explain how judges are appointed, the use of juries. Here, you need to cover the role of the jury, judiciary, and this is learning slides, learning outcome 19 to 22, learning outcome three. Here, you need to identify the role of the judiciary and how the appointment system works. And that is 70 to 100 words. Do you need to ask a question, Ada? Yes, yes, please. Okay. I just, just ask yeah. yeah, I just yeah. need to make sure about the subtitle in yeah. uh, AC 3.2, please. Yeah. Yeah, so you need to, this is the title, Analyze the Role. Can you see that? So that would be your that would be your title, your heading, and you would write under that. Do not uh, change the wording. Okay, keep it as it is. Okay, 
because you know if you start changing the wording it's not going to make sense and the assessor will be struggling to mark it okay so that's the heading for that one is that okay Ada? yes yes thank you so then the next one is analyze the function of jury in criminal trials and that's the heading ac 3.3 here you should have show a holistic understanding of criminal and civil process from the origin of the claim, offence through to courts of appeal. Here you need to explain the function of the jury in a criminal trial. You need to take up case law example to explain the role of the jury and the case law should show that the jury is to decide on guilt based on evidence and then provide a judgment. And that would be words up to 70 to 100 words. Then the next one is to assess the duty and powers of the police. And that is there, 4.1. Here you should explain the role of the police and how this links to the Crown Prosecution Service. Here assess means careful consideration of all factors. So you need to cover the duty and the powers of the police. Refer to slides two to five, specifically cover one of the powers of the police and that's word limit 50 to 75. The next one is to assess the role of the Crown Prosecution Service, AC 4.2, and that's the heading there. You should explain the role of the police and how this links to the Crown Prosecution Service. Here, assess means carefully consideration of all factors. So you need to cover the role of the CPS and refer to slide six to 10, specifically cover the five roles of the CPS and word count 50 to 75. Then this is the next part, which is to examine the latest reforms of the civil justice system at 4.3 and look at the use of juries and show awareness of the latest reforms to court and legal processes. Examine here the means, look in close details and establish the key facts and important issues which affected the civil justice process. Refer to slides learning outcome 4, 11 to 14, because it says examine, you will need to read the handout on Moodle, which is called civil justice system in a time of change and summarize this uh, of in a few bullet points. So 70 to a hundred words. Now for a merit distinct, for a merit grade, you need to analyze and you would put this as a heading so this is for merit this would be your head heading so analyze and parliamentary and governmental efforts to widen access to the legal profession so here you need to summarize the changes that government is doing to widen the access profession you can read this article these two articles to summarize that for uh, 3m1 then this is your next heading compare and contrast the drawbacks of different types of alternative dispute resolutions. Here you need to do a table with the advantages and disadvantages and the article is just there as well that you can refer to. For distinction, you need to put this as a heading and all the information there. You need to analyze the tension between secondary legislation and principle of separation of powers and that's AC1D1. See the handout on Moodle on separation of powers. You need to talk about the doctrine of separation of powers, what it is, and refer to learning outcome one, slides 36 to 41, and read the handout on Moodle, pages 12 to 15. The next part of it, if you want to get a distinction, is to analyse social, political and economic causes of miscarriages of justice. AC4D1. You need to make it clear that you have done the distinction uh, work, the extension work, merit or distinction. Here you need to discuss the changes in relation to miscarriages of justice. Use the case study for the Guildford 4 and Maguire 7 to discuss the issues around miscarriages of justice. And it's 80 to 100 words and refer to the case study handout on Microsoft Word on Moodle, and this is a good link to read as well on Law Teacher. Task two, so that was all task one. Task two, case analysis. Here you are asked to produce an analysis of a case and explain how judicial precedent works in English courts. 
The case you need to analyze and refer to in this article is the case of Alcock against Chief Executive of South Yorkshire Police 1992, which is the case related to the Hillsborough Stadium disaster in 1999. And the full facts of the case are on this link here, bailey.org.uk. In your case, you must explain the doctrine of judicial precedent, AC 2.1. You must distinguish between binding, non-binding and persuasive decisions, AC 2.2. And to gain a merit, you must determine the ratio decedendi and obiter dicta in the Alcock against Chief Constable 1992 case. Learning outcome 2, 2.1, 2.2 .2 and 2M1. Here you should analyse the given case using it to illustrate the doctrine of judicial precedent and explain when decisions are not are binding, non-binding and persuasive. You need to refer to other cases such as Page and Smith, White and Chief Constable uh, Yorkshire Police and McLaughlin to show how decisions are applied. The ratio distendi of the case should be determined and the issue of the psychiatric harm can be claimed and the obiter dictum. Task three, mooting exercise. In preparation for a mooting exercise, you are asked to analyze the following scenario, applying relevant cases and statutory provisions. So here the scenario, Harry Pollard is a delivery driver or a builder's merchant. When delivering into the large construction site, he witnessed the collapse and subsequent fire in a building which several people were working. He witnessed the incident from site, office, and was not close enough to be in any physical danger, but saw some horrific sights as people fell from the top of the building and were burned in the fire. Pollard has been off sick since the incident and is making a claim for psychiatric harm against a construction company. Okay, so you should explain. First heading, explain the importance of a bundle, AC 5.1. Secondly, you should analyse and apply relevant cases, provisions to the scenario, AC 5.2. And then you should present another one, present the arguments for the party involved in the given scenario, AC 5.3. So this is what you need to do for the mooting one. For LO5, AC 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, you should explain what is contained in a bundle, all documents relevant to the case and why it's important to allow participants to follow an argument. You should analyse the given scenario, which is in, in that case, Harry's scenario, and consider relevant legislation. Things like you should consider Health and Safety at Work Act. You should consider the duty of care or and relevant cases and these are the other cases. You should also look at arguments should be presented clearly for each party and all answers must be specifically related to Harry's situation. Now to gain a distinction for that, you need to evaluate the claim and the defence based on the given scenario. So here you need to look at AC 5D1 and refer to learning Outcome five, slide 14. The next element to get a distinction is to look at evaluations should cover the claim and suitable defence. You need to refer to learning outcome five, slide 14. Here you need to take one of the case examples. So only one, okay? So McFallon against EE e. Caledonian, Alcock against Chief Constable for South Yorkshire Police, and White against Chief Constable of South Yorkshire. Use one of the cases to show evaluation, discuss them, so 125 to 150 words. General guidelines, useful tips, read the task carefully, focus on the details, make sure you have got headings for each task. The command words here, explain, def define, describe 70 to 100 words, Assess, examine, clarify, analyze 100 to 125 words. Compare, contrast, critically analyze 150 to 200 words. Make sure you are 
uh, you are putting in there what the actual assessment says rather than putting in your own headings, okay? Because don't change the wording. You must use Harvard referencing. So author, the date, the style, for example, Johnson and Woods, 2011, that would be in the text. And then the full citation of that Johnson and Woods would be in your reference list. And keep an eye on your uh, word count. Your merit and distinction, make sure there's such sufficient evidence of critical analysis. Critique the arguments supported by your academic literature and ensure that you include relevant theoretical models and examples. Use peer reviewed journals for supporting or critique of the topic and at least 20 high quality references. Avoid low quality references such as blogs. Make sure you are referencing your work using the Harvard system and referring to articles, okay? Refer to ebooks, articles, journals, or Moodles. Any questions, you can email learnerwork at ukvarsity.co.uk. Submission of assignment could be at learnerwork at ukvarsity.uk. And it's normally submission and is two weeks after completion. If you need more time, you need to discuss that with the tutor. Okay, which is um, email UK, learnerwork at ukvarsity.co.uk. So have anyone, has you got any questions? I'm just going to refer you to something else. Just, just give me one minute. Uh, oh. So... I have a question, yes. please. Yeah. Uh, could you please, if it possible, show me a mock assignment? Um, I ha I haven't got. Maybe you should email the you know the link that UK Varsity one, and ask them for a sample because I don't have a sample one here. Let me just let me just see if I've got a sample one. So the assignment, yeah. I'll, I'll just yeah. show you the assignment. There will be some samples on Moodle. There's a sample. There's a yeah. sample. Is it on Moodle, Jacqueline? Yeah, it's on Moodle. Yeah. So if you, Ada, if you go on oh, to okay. Moodle, there are samples on Moodle for you. So this is the, the assignment PDF um, that I've mm -hmm. just gone through is mm -hmm. actual uh, assignment uh, PowerPoint slides. This is the actual assignment. So it shows you which is, when you're doing each one. So task one, you need to do all them, Ada, uh, and each of them must be a heading. Do you understand? So mm. within task one, if you're talking about the first one, you must distinguish between primary and secondary and delegated legislation. That is one heading. Yeah. Each of you need to work on each one. Oh, sorry. Can you see that now? Yeah. So each one is a heading. So you have to cover each one. Jacqueline, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, please. Yes, please. So, so when you do, when you do the first part, so how many within task one, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten things to do. And you will have ten headings. Okay. Okay. So you need to do them. Now, if you want to get that is for a pass mark. If you want to get a merit and distinction, you need to do two of these in a merit one and then two of them to gain a distinction. And this is only for task one. What am I doing? Sorry. Um, can you, you can't see it. Can you just one minute? Has it gone off? Um, just one minute. Here. Just one minute, I'm just going to open up the... Okay, so within this, you've got... Let me just go back to the assignment. So this is all task one. Do you all... Do you both understand that? Yes, So please. you've got task one. Within the pass mark, you've got 10 parts of task one. To get a merit or a distinction, you need to do the merit ones. And these are the headings. So there's two elements in that. For the distinction, you need to do two elements and then the heading. Okay, so that's the, the slides I showed you on the uh, assignment are like ex extensions to show you how to elaborate. This is the assignment, okay? Then to go on to task two, in this case, you must look at these elements. So you've got two there. Can you see them too? 
explain the doctrine of judicial precedence, and then distinguish binding. So you need each heading for each one. So you'll talk about the doctrine of judicial precedent as a heading, and then to gain a merit, you've got one where you look at the ratio decidendi and orbiter dicta of the Alcott case. So that's task two. So you've got three parts to do in that. Okay, so you have the merit. Is there any questions on task two? No, please. And then you've got task three here, okay? And that's the mooting exercise. Um, and you've got, in, within the first one, to get the pass, you need to look at the importance of bundle. And then you need to analyze relevant cases. And then you need to present the arguments of the parties. Now, to gain a distinction for that, you need to evaluate. Make sure it's clear that you are putting these as headings and you've got the distinction ones as headings as well. To make sure that the learner, sorry, the assessor is able to understand that you've done the merit stuff and the distinction stuff for each task. So make sure you do all of task one. And then within task one, if you want to do the merit and distinction, do that. And then all of task two, and do the merit and distinction one, all of task three, and do the merit and distinction one. Just some guidelines there, uh, suggested evidence, what you need to do uh, in regards to learning outcome one, two, and three, and the tasks as well that you need to do. And this is just, this is the assignment that you need to complete. So make sure you are using Harvard referencing, make sure you've got headings, make sure you are referencing your work, make sure you're using case law, make sure you are sticking to what the question is, what, what you are being asked rather than changing it. So if it says distinguish between primary and secondary and delegated legislation, you will put that as a heading. Don't change the wording around, okay? Keep okay. the headings as they are, because then, you know, it, it makes it difficult for someone to mark it. If you are doing the merit ones, put all that in as a heading, okay? So you should have your name on it. You should have the module on it. You can have a contents page if you want, and then you should be able to identify each one uh, and talk about each one. And it's very clear next to it which learning outcomes apply to it. For task one, two and three. Have you got any questions before we finish the session? No, thank you. No, everything is clear. Thank you so much. Is that okay? I'm just trying to, so make sure you, you know, when you do it in a Word document that your headings are clear, underline your headings. So you're talking about this 10 parts there, you'll have 10 headings and then you'll talk under the headings, okay? Make sure it's clear, make sure you're providing references at the end and make sure you're using the Harvard system and you know, make sure that you are answering what the question is asking you, okay? Okay. Any okay. questions before we finish? And good luck. And it was lovely teaching both of you. Jacqueline, I've taught you before as well. Yeah. Um, Ada, and um, I hope to receive your assignments and start, start doing them now because it'll be fresh in your head and you've got access to the resources. All the learning outcomes from learning outcome one, two, three, four, and five, I've recorded with uh, uh, with uh, my uh, with details on there, and there's additional reading on Moodle, uh, so you can start as it'll be fresh in your head. Okay. Any final questions before I go? No. Okay. Thank you for attending today's session, and good luck in completing the assignment. Thank you, too. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ada. Thank you, Jacqueline. And have a nice week. You, too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.